Welcome to the Learning Lounge with Greg Parody on Lake Sumter Television. I'm Mark Roberts. You work in kind of a two to three month period when you bring clients on board and go through a whole education process. And I had the chance to watch one of your presentations and I was captivated by this concept of seeds and trees and I'm not even going to begin to try to do it justice. So I'm going to give it over to you. How do trees and seeds figure into, into retirement planning? Well, that's kind of my signature presentation. You know, over the years, I found that people had a hard time uh, grasping the concept of the tax implications of their retirement assets. So I basically broke it into three different categories. And the way that I did it is instead of um, trying to save a bunch of retirement assets, I just used the analogy of building your own or creating your own uh, family farm. And so building your own farm, you're going to have to start with seeds. So there are basically three different types of seeds that you can buy with your seed money. There are three basic kinds of seeds that you can use to grow these crops. No, three that we talk about anyway. The first batch of seeds, or the first selection or choice that you have, are the cheapest ones. And they're the most popular ones. And we call them the red seeds. And the reason why we call them the red seeds is because when you look at these assets, I want you to just stop and consider a few things before you draw from them. I call them the cheapest seeds because when you buy the seeds, you actually get to deduct the cost of the seeds from your income. So you get a tax break on the seeds. Okay? And then when you plant the seeds, you don't pay any taxes on the growth of the trees. So as the crops and the trees start to take root and they start to grow, you don't pay any taxes on the growth either. So you don't pay taxes on the seeds and you don't pay taxes on the trees until you get to Retirement, which is good because when you get to retirement, you'll all be in a much lower tax bracket, right? Or at least that's the story. Well, these seeds came out in 1974 and they were called IRA seeds, okay? Tax deferred seeds, IRA seeds. And so most of the retirement accounts that we see, IRAs, 401ks, my teachers had 403Bs, uh, government employees had 457 plans. All of those are essentially the same thing. Our red trees are called qualified assets. It means you've never paid taxes on any of it, and you won't pay taxes on any of it until you take the money out. And you can't touch it until you are 59 and a half, and you must start taking it when you turn yes. 70 and a half. So that's the red trees, and we'll come back to those in a second. But you know, if you were growing a farm, you certainly would not just plant one crop, right, Walt? Right. You would want to diversify your crop. I, for one, would want to diversify my crop. So along the way, you might choose some other options, and I call the second option the yellow seeds. Yellow seeds turn into yellow trees. Now, these are a little bit unique. The red trees you don't pay any taxes on the seeds. The yellow seeds, you do. You pay taxes on the seeds, and then as your investments grow or the asset grows, you pay taxes on the growth. So if we were talking about, uh, for example, a bank CD, every year you would pay taxes on the interest that they earn. So back when bank CDs used to pay interest, you would get a 1099 every year, right? You'd pay taxes on the growth, and then next year, that would be your starting point, and if it grew again, you'd pay taxes on that too, whether you used it or not. But a good way to look at yellow, the yellow trees, which are also called non-qualified assets, is you pay as you go. So far, we've got the red trees. Those have never been taxed. We've got the yellow trees, which are partially taxed and taxed as you go. And then there's my favorite kind of trees, uh, the trees that I, or, or the seeds rather, that I invest most of my money in, and the strategy that I love the most, quite frankly. It's, um, to me, it's a common sense strategy. You pay taxes on the seeds one time. Okay, so before I go too much further, this is not an I hate paying taxes seminar because I don't mind paying taxes, okay? I just don't want to pay taxes uh, on the same money over and over again, and I don't want to pay more than I have to, 
Okay? So I'm only willing to pay what I have to pay, and I don't want to overpay. And so to me, I'll pay taxes one time, and so these seeds are perfect for me, because you pay taxes on the seeds one time. That's it. And when the trees grow, we call them the green trees. As the trees grow, they're 100% income tax free. So here's the deal. The red trees have never been taxed. The green trees will never be taxed under the current tax law. Taxes on the seeds, trees for free, tax break on the seeds, and now we have to pay taxes on all the trees. How many people think it would be valuable to have a strategy in place where you could start taking money out of the red trees or even out of the yellow trees while taxes are still low and reposition them over here into a tax-free position or a tax-favorable position? How many people think it would be valuable to have a pile of trees over there five, ten years from now that you knew exactly how much was in there and when you go to take it, it was all yours? I think so too. So you have three different categories. Your tax deferred assets, which are your IRAs and your red trees. Your after tax money, your bank accounts. And then your tax free trees, tax free or tax favored uh, assets. So there's three different asset classes. But even still it became complicated uh, or hard for people to grasp the concept deferred and, and tax free. So we created a presentation uh, that, we would, that we call our heart presentation. We think it does a really good job of explaining from a very high level the basics of how and where these withdrawals from red, yellow, or green can have an impact on your overall retirement plan. First of all, how many people honestly believe that taxes are really low today? Like you go home and you say, I just feel so good to be in such a low tax rate. I'm just so happy that taxes are as low as they are. Very few people. Some do. But we did a little... Uh, we did a little his and hers case study to demonstrate or illustrate exactly how low we consider taxes to be today. So what we have here is we have, um, we took a retired couple and we, we assumed that he had $2,000 a month in Social Security. And we assumed that he had $3,000 a month as a pension. And to supplement the Social Security and the pension, he took $2,000 a month. That's not going to work. $2,000 a month. from the red trees, giving him a total of $7,000 a month. Now, she stayed at home with the baby. So she obviously only gets paid $1,000 a month. That is a joke. Because she has the toughest job, but gets the smallest social security, right? So he gets $7,000 a month, and she gets $1,000 a month, so she gets $8,000 a month. Okay? Yes. <laughs> so let's just talk about $8,000 a month as it relates to taxes, okay? This is a married couple. How many people married? <laughs> Murph, how many happily married years? <laughs> We've had 14 wonderful years. Yes. Out of how many? 52. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's a married couple, um, 14 wonderful years out of 52, with $8,000 a month in income. What's the tax bill? Because we get so screwed up in our taxes, right? We get, we get confused with the brackets. I mean, imagine a tax paying system where you have to pay somebody every year to calculate how much you have to pay somebody every year. It's a, just a really kind of a, 
a nonsense system the way that it works. But here's that married couple, $36,000 a year in Social Security, $36,000 pension, $24,000 coming from the red trees, total income $96,000, the total effective tax rate is 10%. Excuse me. There we go. How many people think paying 10% effective tax is reasonable? I think 10% is reasonable. Okay. Remember what happens if you die and, and, and you don't get to spend it? How much gets taxed? Up to, up to 40, right? So this means if you just start taking a little bit out, in this particular case, you're at 10%. Now here's the problem with this system. At some point, one of these spouses will pass away. In most cases, he will pass away. Because he wants to. <laughs> so, so in that case, she loses the thousand dollars in Social Security, and she gets his. And because he loves her so much, he selected a survivor benefit that was 50% of the pension. So in this case, she gets 1500 a month. That's a pretty significant drop, right? Okay. So we're at 2000 in Social Security, 1500 in the pension, and then let's just say we wanted to keep her income at $8,000 a month. Why? He has to come back and work for her. <laughs> Is that right? No. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. How many teachers are in here? Matt, you're a certified fund. Okay. So we get this all the way up to eight thousand a month. The only difference. Is that she's got a broken heart. So we take this and we say we're taking 4,500. God, I keep hitting the pink. From the red trees. So we take 4,500 from the red trees, give it up to 8,000. Same exact income. The only difference is she's filing single. $96,000 a year, total effective tax rate 17%. So the exact same income, the only difference is she doesn't have him around or he doesn't have her around. It doesn't matter that the income is the same because the effective tax goes up 70%. Okay? So taxes are going up. Is there anybody in here that think taxes are, could possibly go down? Okay, I wanna make sure I'm in the right, right, right room. So we just, with this case study, to make a point, and to really anchor down our philosophy of paying taxes now and having a strategy in place to take the money out, we said if this were the situation and she was going to pay 17% anyway, why don't we take as much money out of the red trees now while you're both married and let's see how high we can go before a married couple pays 17% effective tax. So here's what we did. We went back to the married couple, and instead of taking $2,000 a month right here, we increased it to $4,000 a month. And that increased their annual income to $120,000, which still kept us at 12%. How many people think 12% is reasonable? 12% is reasonable, right? So we can go up to $120,000, 12%. Now in this example, keep in mind that I assumed there was no mortgage payments and no other deductions. This was just standard deductions and exemptions. So now we're at 12%. Pete Smith, one of my clients who is uh, who's with us tonight, wants to know how I came up with this one and I'm gonna refer you to Kathy Lassiter. We want it to be extreme 
And we said, okay, I know that you're living on the $2,000 a month for the red trees, but what if we just increased it to $8,000 every month just from the red trees? So now your total income is up to 168,000, 36,000 combined social security, 36,000 in pension, 96,000 a year coming out of the red trees, total is 168, effective tax rate 16%. The reason we stopped at 168 is because if we go too much higher than that, then we would have to start considering Medicare taxes. If your income is too high, then you start to pay a little bit more for your Medicare Part B premiums and things of that nature, okay? Which they don't call a tax. They call it something else. But it feels like a tax if you're paying it, right? Okay. So here's the difference between just kind of going along and actually having a strategy. And this is a pretty extreme strategy that I'm going to illustrate for you. What happens if he's gone or she's gone? We've got one person paying taxes now. $2,000 a month in Social Security. $18,000, I'm sorry, yeah, $24,000 a year in Social Security. $18,000 a year in a pension. But what if we were taking the $4,500 a month right here and instead of taking it from the red trees, we had a strategy in place where you could take it from the green trees. So instead of taking it from over there, you were able to take it from over here. So 54000 a year, total income is 96000 but because it's coming from tax-free money, your total tax is 1%. That is the difference between going year to year and investing and trying to grow your assets and creating a retirement strategy, in this case, a succession strategy for the ones that you love and you care about. All right, with that, we're gonna take a quick break, but I got a ton of questions. Stay tuned, you're watching The Learning Lounge with Greg Parity right here on Lake Sumter TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Learning Lounge with Greg Parody on Lake Center TV. I'm Mark Roberts. We just watched a pretty interesting presentation that, that involved a lot of numbers. Where do those numbers come from? So <laughs> Greg and I designed the case study. It is accurate, um, but it's maybe a little simplified. We've got a couple age 65. They've got nothing but Social Security, pension, and RMDs or, or funds out of their IRAs. We uh, assume no itemized deductions, no mortgage interest or property taxes, just standard deduction. And I'm sorry, you said RMDs? Required minimum distributions Thank you. from their IRAs. Gotcha. Yes, yeah. And the, the examples we used were really meant to show um, individuals the, the way the tax brackets work and the differences between married couples and a single individual. Um, and, and to really point out that you can take so much more income as a married couple and still pay less tax um, at an effective rate than you will um, when you eventually become a single taxpayer. One of the other points that was punctuated during that presentation was tax, tax levels, tax brackets, mm -hmm. where we are today versus not being able to predict the future. How important is that in the planning strategy? I think it's extremely important. Um, we are at historically low tax rates, and uh, I think with the way the uh, economy is and the world today, it is very safe to assume we will be at a higher tax bracket in the future. So maximizing the money now in anticipation of higher taxes in the future? Exactly, exactly. Well, and, and really, even right off the bat with the, with the case study that we used, even if taxes don't go up and you lose your spouse, taxes go up. 
you know, so we get caught with tax hikes. You know, at the end of the day, it only really matters how much money you get to spend, how much money, you know, it doesn't matter how much income you have, it matters how much money you keep. And a lot of people make decisions on how much income they take because they're afraid they might go in the next bracket. Well, most of those examples we give you are in the 25% tax bracket or higher. But you notice that the effective tax dollars that are being paid never go above 17%. And so people get really paralyzed by the tax brackets and they're making decisions that sometimes could be costing them money now. You know, who cares if you lose 10% in, in, in the stock market or in any investment or anywhere? So we think having an effective tax strategy for your income planning is really important. Moving some of the money from the trees, there's a, there's a part of it that seems almost counterintuitive. It goes against what I think we've been taught to understand about not, not cashing in that 401k you know, before you're supposed to. How do you work with your, with your clients and educate them through that process, moving them through maybe that discomfort of, that's not what I thought kind of mindset? Can I start? Yeah. So you know, we're not suggesting that you take all of your, you know, in that case study, it's pretty dramatic at the end, right? We say, well, the final example, you're paying 1% tax. That is to, just to highlight the difference between going along the way that you always have or the way that we're taught, invest for the future, save, accumulate, versus having a, a strategy in place. Very rarely would you cash in a 401k, pay all of the taxes, and put it over here in, in the tax-free position, whether it's in life insurance or in a Roth IRA. Very rarely, almost never. But one of the things that Kathy is so good at is working with people based on their current income levels and designing a strategy where you start to take money out of tax deferred positions or after tax positions and reposition them into, um, into a tax, tax free or tax favored spot. And she has a, a way that she does that. You know, she, we can talk a little bit more about how you, how you do that. Work that magic. Yeah, work magic for us. So, you know, what we try to do is to maximize your tax bracket. Um, you know, not to put you in a new tax bracket or, or pay a new tax rate, but to make sure that you are getting the full benefit from where you are. Um, we try to create balance in your, in your asset holdings. So um, some, some people may have all red trees and, and no um, non-qualified assets and no tax-free assets and and that's not a healthy place to be um, you have an emergency and you need to to get at resources you are going to have to take so much more than you really need in order to pay the taxes so we try to create a balance for them so that they have yellow trees green trees red trees and we try to do it strategically we try to do it over the long term and we try to do it um, in a way that is flexible so if their needs change we can we can change the plan one of the elements in the equation is pension and and my sense is that pension is becoming less and less of a factor for a lot of retirees how will your presentation evolve over time when pension no longer is one of those one of those valuable assets well if you refer to that case study that we just talked about you're gonna, your IRAs and your retirement accounts are gonna have a lot more pressure on them than they ever did before. You know, we're showing in that, in that example, taking a little bit out of your IRAs, or your red trees to supplement your existing fixed income. Well, a lot more people are retiring without any fixed income. And so you're needing more money to go into annuities to, to guarantee that income stream uh, so that you can be assured that you will you'll have enough money to last the rest of your life and it will continue for your spouse uh, for the rest of her life, and, and that's the case. And so it's putting an awful lot more pressure on people's money. That whole case study really highlights, it highlights several things, but people save their money so that their spouse will have enough money when they're gone. So they're literally saving their money so that when you're not around to enjoy it with them anymore, they'll have enough. And so you know, we've talked about in other uh, episodes and other programs, you know, where's the value of life insurance? The value of life insurance is where you take a little bit out of the red trees and you go buy the life insurance so that you don't have to worry about your family when you're gone. The heart presentation is so that the two of you can start taking the rest of the income and just enjoy it. Do stuff with it. Make memories together because when you lose a spouse or one spouse gets sick, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it matters what you did with it. Okay, so as long as you're financially confident that you'll both have enough money, you won't outlive it, it's about making memories. And really, we are at historically low tax rates, and 
people should be taking a little bit more money out if they want to do more things with it, as long as it doesn't mortgage their future. I'm just curious, we, when you start to talk, first of all, I think money is a very emotional subject to begin with, and then you start to talk about mortality as part of that conversation. Um, is, that a, is that a tricky conversation to have with people? I don't have a tough time with it because I always ask people right up front when they're going to die, so if they would just tell me right up front, we don't have to worry about it. We just get it out of the way. Yeah, it can be, it can be tricky, you know, but look, everybody knows the score coming in. I think if you don't talk about it, then it's the elephant in the room. And the reality is this, one day you won't be able, to, you'll, you'll either slow down and you won't be able to do as much. Um, and then one day you're going to lose your best friend. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen at some point. So what you do between now and then is what matters. You can't control the other part. As far as I know, there's a 50% chance that everybody will die one day. What's the other 50? The 100% chance that they'll fall. <laughs> I, I should add, Kathy Laster is a, a partner and a, uh, a CPA and a certified financial planner as well. Um, what are some of the most common questions or some of the most common concerns that you are asked? I mean, you probably have to deal with the most complicated portion of this equation when you start to talk about the, the tax implication and tax planning. What are some of the more common questions that you're asked? You know, I have, there's a lot of confusion about tax brackets and, and there's a lot of fear about, I don't want to get into the next tax bracket. I don't want to get into the next tax bracket. And, and I think the example, the, the heart presentation really shows that, you know, you can move from the 15 to the 25% tax bracket and it only changes your effective tax rate by a percent. Um, it doesn't, it's not a huge drastic increase. And I think when, when uh, people see that and, and, you know, we create, um, a plan for them and we try to do tax projections um, for them and they can see what the actual cost is, I think that really makes a difference for them. Seeds, trees, and hearts. Seeds, trees, and hearts. Well done. I appreciate it. Thank you. You've been watching The Learning Lounge on Lake Center TV with Greg Parody and Kathy Laster joining us. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.